This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Visit the link on screen or in the description below to get a free two month premium trial. Risk is the fundamental balancing force of investing. It is the yin to returns yang that forever forces us to consider not only how much we earn from our positions, but also how much we're willing to lose. It's an ever important factor for investors to understand. While our primary focus is often on maximizing return, the truth is we each have a limiting tolerance of how much risk we can take based on our unique circumstances, a level we should not exceed, lest we put our finances in great danger. But how does one measure risk? Well, conventionally, the answer has been volatility, or how much a stock's price fluctuates, with measures of volatility coming to represent risk in a wide array of formulas, models, and theories used by investors around the world. There's just one problem. Volatility isn't risk. At least, that's the viewpoint of many value investors, myself included. You see, while the day-to-day -day fluctuations of a stock can provide some insight into risk, there are many shortcomings to relying on this narrow definition. And in many ways, the viewpoint can actually lead investors to make poor financial decisions. How? We'll answer that question and more on today's Plain Bagel. Risk from the broadest financial sense is the probability of an investor losing money. It comes from many different sources, ranging from internal factors like a company's management getting caught in some scandal, to the more external environment that the company operates within, inclusive of the government and the economy as a whole. Despite its numerous sources, modern portfolio theory argues that risk can be boiled down to a stock's volatility, either in the form of standard deviation, which if you remember from your high school statistics class, is how much something deviates from its average, or through its beta, which is how much a stock deviates from the market as a whole, although there are other measurements of volatility sometimes used. Overall, using volatility as a proxy for risk is an easy enough logic to follow. A stock's price should, in an efficient market, reflect all information about that company. And a fluctuating stock price likely reflects uncertainty from investors, implying a higher risk. On top of this, higher volatility means the stock is more likely to reach lower lows, all else held constant. So for an investor looking to sell, volatility will increase the chance of them selling when things are down. These assumptions have formed the basis of theories, modern research papers, and popular financial formulas used by many across the industry. But in a 2007 shareholders meeting, Warren Buffett famously declared, Volatility does not measure risk. The reason? While volatility does provide information about a stock's price, it has a number of shortcomings that in certain situations actually make it a pretty bad gauge of an investor's risk. Now, not everyone agrees with Warren Buffett here. There are many investors, and especially traders, who believe volatility is the best measure of risk that we have. And I'm not gonna stand here and claim that I, Richard Coffin, have a better approach than the industry. But there's a lot to be gained by viewing risk from a different perspective. Not only will it help you avoid the common pitfalls that investors see that comes from focusing too much on volatility, but it should help you better tolerate market declines as a whole. But before we get into the alternative definition of risk, what are the shortcomings of volatility? Well, there are really three that I believe are worth highlighting. The first is that not all volatility is actually bad. Remember, volatility measures the dispersion of a stock's price from its mean or its average, which includes downwards and upwards movements. For example, take a look at the following two stock graphs. Which would you say is a riskier investment? Well, according to volatility, the answer would be stock B given that the price deviates more from its average. But if we go back to our definition of risk, the probability of losing money, it's clear that stock A has done just that for its investors and is clearly not doing very well. So it could be argued that volatility is wrong here. Now, there are some measures out there like downside deviation that address this by only accounting for downward movements in a stock's price. So one could avoid this problem while still using volatility, but that doesn't prevent the second shortcoming. Volatility is a backwards looking measure. In order to calculate volatility, we need to use historical pricing data. And while this may tell us the risk that the stock faced in the past, in practice, investors should only care about what the future holds, not what the stock has already done. For example, imagine you're invested in a public company that operates two businesses, a boring yet stable utility company and a high growth, high risk experimental energy firm that's trying to run cars off potatoes. Don't steal my adventure idea. 
For years, this company has had a fairly stable stock price. But let's say you find out today that the firm will be selling its utility business. Logically, the investment has now become a higher risk holding. Now it's relying just on those potatoes to run those cars. But the historical volatility won't reflect this change until some more time has passed. Even if the price jumps or drops today, the measure of volatility is often measured over a period of time and will be influenced by past pricing data that is no longer relevant. So according to modern portfolio theory, this investment may still be appropriate for more conservative investors, even though in reality, that's clearly not the case. Now, this isn't to say that there's no value in studying the past. We can still gain valuable insights by observing how a stock has moved historically. But as you can see, relying exclusively on the volatility can lead you to miss fundamental changes in the business that might alter the risk you're facing. Finally, the third shortcoming of volatility is that it focuses exclusively on price without considering something's actual value. Now, this is a point of debate among investors from different schools of thought, namely active versus passive. But value investors believe that stock prices can deviate from a stock's true worth. And just because a stock price is fluctuating doesn't mean that the value or true worth of the asset has changed. This is something Buffett himself explained through an example in the same shareholder meeting we mentioned earlier. Imagine that an acre of farmland is currently selling for $2,000, and after some market volatility, the price has dropped to $600. Using volatility as a measure of risk, it would be argued that an investor is now taking on much more risk buying the farmland at $600 than they would if they had purchased at $2,000. But clearly that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The investor is buying the same asset for a steep discount, and in fact is now risking much less money with the investment. But because the price has moved, it's now considered more volatile and therefore more risky. Most people would see this as a fairly clear cut argument against volatility. But when it comes to stocks, investors are less willing to look past the price movements of the asset. Perhaps it's because stocks aren't as tangible as a field of crops, or because we are provided second by second pricing data that often distracts us from the companies we own. But regardless of the reason, we tend to believe that stocks that have dropped in price are now higher risk than those that have risen in price, even though the lower price allows us to put less money at risk when we buy the stock. Put another way, stocks are one of the few things in life that humans enjoy buying when it's more expensive to do so. And likewise, one of the things we often try to sell when it's likely to provide a loss. It's sort of backwards, isn't it? And I think part of the reason is because we tend to view volatility as being risk. A drop in a stock's price leads us to believe that a company has become riskier, even if its underlying business hasn't changed in that circumstance. So how should investors view risk if not through the lens of volatility? Well, let's go back to our definition from the beginning of the video. Within the context of investing, risk is the probability of losing money, or as value investors like to put it, the probability of permanent capital impairment. And there are only two things that can cause such an impairment of an investor's capital. The first is selling when a stock's price is down, because while stock prices fluctuate daily, losses are only realized when we actually sell the position. The second cause is some irrevocable change to the underlying investment. That is, the very nature of the company we hold or its business as a whole has changed, resulting in a decline in the stock's inherent value. This could include a substitute making a firm's product now obsolete, or some new regulation significantly hampering a company's operations. Regardless of the cause, these events can greatly impair the value of a holding and lead to a loss, even if the investor continues to hold. Now, the average Joe investor can rarely stop a company from going out of business, but we fortunately have a lot of control over the first factor. Of course, holding a stock forever doesn't guarantee that you will make a profit, but being the emotional creatures that we are, we tend to make poor investment decisions when we watch our stocks on a daily basis. So by controlling our impulses and actually ignoring volatility, we can reduce the probability of selling when things are down, which in turn will actually lower our risk. Now, while this viewpoint can really benefit the individual investor, it doesn't actually provide any real method for calculating risk. So for many, volatility is still the best thing we have when it comes to quantifying our exposure. I myself often use standard deviation to compare their risk adjusted return of different stocks. So I'm not standing here saying that volatility has no value. And there are also some circumstances under which volatility really is one of your primary risks, namely if you face a short term time horizon. For someone trying to sell their stock over the next 30 days, for example, the day to day fluctuations become a lot more important to their return. 
But for anyone investing over the long term, volatility doesn't really paint the whole picture and may tempt you to sell when things are down, which itself increases our probability of selling at a loss. So if you're investing for the long term, take the perspective of the farmer. Sure, the market might be telling you the second by second changes to the value of your land, but what do you care? If you know what you're doing and you find that you're able to grow the same number of crops as you were the year before, then realistically you aren't facing any more risk than you did before. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. If you like what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe. Hit the bell icon for notifications about future videos. If you have any feedback or topics you want me to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. For The Plain Bagel, my name is Richard Coffin. Thanks for joining me today. As an investment analyst, I'm always trying to learn new things, whether it be about new companies, financial products, or just things I haven't yet learned through my job or education. I try to be a continual learner, and that goes beyond just within the world of investing. For example, lately I've been really into DIY home renos, partly out of need for the new house we purchased, but partly out of interest. And to help learn these new skills, I've been using Skillshare quite a lot lately. Skillshare is today's sponsor, and they offer a learning platform with thousands of tutorials and lessons on most any skill you can think of. For example, for anyone looking to create videos like I do, I always suggest they check out video editing with Adobe Premiere Pro for beginners. It covers how to use the program that I use to edit my own videos, and I learned a few really helpful shortcuts and tools watching it myself. But maybe you're looking for something to help you with your career. Well, Skillshare has you covered there as well. For example, I found How to Get a Job, a step-by-step -step guide to be a handy overview of the things you need to be aware of if you're looking to start or change your career. It's a really handy service. It's all accessible online, lessons are segmented so that you can tackle the new skill over time, and the skills they cover are seemingly endless. You can go to their site right now and search what you're interested in to see if they have something to offer. And if you do decide you want to try it out, the first 1,000 people to go to the link in the description below will get a two-month free trial of their premium membership, which gives you unlimited access to the courses. So learn something new today, support the channel, and check out Skillshare.